Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining this WHO EpiWin webinar on the topic of managing dengue, a rapidly expanding epidemic, hosted by the WHO EpiWin team. For those new to the EpiWin webinars, this is the WHO Information Network on Epidemics for Science and Knowledge Translation uh, in Health Emergency. With these EpiWin webinars and the associated uh, digests and updates in the form of slide sets, our goal is to translate science in accessible, understandable, and relevant ways for evidence-informed actions and decisions in health emergency preparedness and response. Today, we have a great panel to discuss dengue. I will give a brief introduction of the speakers. We welcome today Dr. Ibrahima Sochefol, uh, Director at the Global Neglected Tropical Diseases Program at WHO. Uh, Dr. Ibrahima Sochefol, please, um, hello to everybody. Dar, uh, Dr. Raman Velayudan, uh, Unit Head on Veterinary Public uh, um, Health Vector Control and Environment uh, at WHO. Dr. Judith Wong, Director for Microbiology and Molecular Epidemiology at the National Environment Agency in Singapore. Dr. Lucy Lum Chai Si, Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Malaya in Malaysia. Dr. Samira Alerariani, who works on malaria and vector control at the Department of Communicable Disease um, uh, Prevention and Control for the WHO Regional Office for Eastern Mediterranean. Dr. Giovannini Coelho, who is a member of the public health entomology team within the Pan-American Health Organization. The panel and the QAA will be moderated by Dr. Raman Velayuda. So I will proceed with some housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being live streamed on the EpiWin YouTube channel. The webinar is being recorded and afterwards the recording will be available from our website. The address will appear in the chat. Interpretation is available today in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Please go to the Interpretation Globe icon to access and select the language. We invite you all to post your name, location, and organization in the chat box. We would love to hear to where you're joining us from. Please add any questions you may have to the Q&A box, not in the chat, so we can more easily keep track of them. So without far any further ado, I will lend the floor over to Dr. Ibrahima Sosefol, for the welcome of this EpiWin webinar on the topic of managing dengue, a rapidly epidemic, expanding epidemic. Over to you, Dr. Ibrahima. Thank you very much, Agnes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, participants, dear friends, I'm really impressed to see the number of participants. We are getting close to 600 now. And uh, looking at the comments in the chat, also people are connected from all over the world. I'm really delighted to welcome each one of you to this pivotal webinar on, on the pricing global health issues of dengue. Today, we're going to do shed light on the alarming spread of dengue while acknowledging its broader context within the realm of neglected tropical diseases, vector bound diseases, but also epidemic prone diseases, and also is critical to interplay with climate change. Dengue as an expanding epidemic prone diseases presents a formidable challenge to global health. Its pervasive impact knows no boundary, accounting for a significant portion of the estimated global burden of communicable diseases, and claiming over an estimate of 40,000 to 70,000 lives annually. With its rich spanning more than 100 pandemic countries and reported cases in over 129 nations, Dengue's relentless expansion demands immediate action and attention. However, these critical health issues cannot be viewed in isolation. The wider context of neglected critical diseases, bone diseases, and with a far-reaching health crisis that disproportionately affect marginalized communities worldwide. Neglected critical diseases on, you know, arboviruses, including dengue, epitomize the urgency of addressing health disparities and advocating for equitable access to health care. In this case, for understanding the profound intersection 
of climate change, disruptable diseases must be acknowledged as our planet grapples with the ramification of environmental shift. We must recognize the direct impact on the population and the potential to transmit diseases like dengue. The evolving climate change, the distribution and burden of these diseases accentuates the urgency of our collective response. The implication of the NPDs within the globe broader global health agenda demand united action. Collaboration across sectors and stakeholders is imperative to afford robust intervention, enhance global health resilience, and fortify healthcare systems. Together, we must spread research, surveillance, and response strategy that safeguard communities and protect them from the escalating impact of dengue and other NTDs on vector-borne diseases. We must channel our expertise, experiences, and resource toward transformative solutions as we navigate this complex terrain. This webinar serves as a platform to pool our knowledge, highlight factual details, exchange high insight, and collectively chart a path forward a healthier and more sustainable world. I extend my deepest appreciation to each participant for dedicating their time and commitment to this critical course. The discussion and collaborative efforts stemming from this forum hold the power to make a tangible difference in our global fight against dengue and all vector-borne diseases, but also neglected tropical diseases. Together, let us embrace the challenge, empower communities, and forge a path forward towards a future. Let us save this moment to enact positive change and protect global health for future generations. I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahim Asosefo, for the amazing opening. Now over to Ramam for the overview of the dengue situation today. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see your slide. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Agnesa. Thank you, Dr. Sose. It was really highlighting the points on where dengue fits in within the overall sphere of NTD and the changes we envisage. Uh, now, my overview of dengue situation is really to highlight where we are uh, in, in a very simple terms, in terms of the epidemiology, as well as the challenges we face. So essentially, in terms of what changes have happened, the mosquito in particular, the vector has continually spread across the world. So it is a silent expansion of the vector. And today we have it in over 130 countries. Dengue is being reported by 130 countries right now, and a population of nearly 4 billion are at risk of this disease. The COVID and its implications have been huge because many of our activities have been curtailed, including reporting. And we have a lot of lessons to learn from COVID. And this is something we will highlight as we move forward. There is a greater interest in arboviral diseases because today, these two mosquitoes, which transmits dengue, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, they also transmit chikungunya, zika, and yellow fever. So basically, it is an arboviral uh, disease which is threatening across the globe, and dengue is, of course, the lead among them. Urbanization and climate change has huge implications on dengue, and there is a lot of studies going on. We will hear more uh, in the coming webinars later on these topics. And today, post-COVID situation, though the pandemic is not died out fully, we have to be prepared to realign programs in order to be more integrated and make sure that the health systems can manage most of our problems as we move forward. So we have done a mapping of dengue. And as I have said earlier, over 130 countries are affected by arboviral diseases. And you can see that a large portion of the world is fully colored. And the the, the blue shades are those area countries which have more than three diseases. The green has two and the yellow has only one, but it is basically, it gives you a very good picture of the threat of dengue, which is now affecting practically all the continents of the world. 
we just to run through the current situation we must remember that since 2010 dengue has been reported in parts of europe almost every year and you can see the cases here been reported and we are still keeping track and from 2018 we had dengue almost every year and uh, 2023 we are the the european region especially ecdc and colleagues are on the alert to see where this problem could arise because there is imminent possibility of this happening any time so we are uh, we are we are expecting that probably there may be few cases this year too now moving on we WHO gets data on dengue from about 104 countries and uh, the eastern mediterranean region we are beginning to get data and there are gaps in this data which still needs to be filled in we will fill in the coming day months and as you can see that dengue is being reported in more and more countries and this year we have major outbreak happening in sudan and there are few cases already reported in egypt in the african region as you may know in 2020 they recorded over 220000 cases and for the first time the regional committee last year passed a framework of integrated control elimination and eradication of tropical and vector borne diseases and this is a very sound framework and we have also done along with the regional office a surveillance and control of arboviral disease in every country of the african region which gives us a clear indication of what needs to be done to scale up activities now dengue in africa is on the increase mainly because uh, it has been masked for many years uh, and uh, now that malaria is on the decline we see more and more dengue outbreaks been reported but dengue has been recorded in many african countries since 1960s the paho region is the area where we have a lot of reports this year in particular and this graph which just got published 2 days ago uh, just shows you the trend and actually in 2023 you can see that it is almost uh, reaching the highest level of nearly over 3 million cases and this is really concerning and we are keeping a close watch on the situation and the regional office is working with the countries in order to improve uh, surveillance and capacity at the country level to deal with this outbreak of um, dengue the rest of the asian region as you know the monsoon season has just uh, got started and it is we we anticipate increase in cases but already the cases have been rising in philippines malaysia vietnam thailand and bangladesh and we feel that more cases will be reported in the coming weeks because soon after any flood it takes about 6 to 8 weeks for an outbreak to begin and we uh we have already alerted and part of the objective of this webinar is to have a greater advocacy to make sure that governments and communities are better prepared especially in parts of asia where we anticipate more outbreaks after the post monsoon period the global trend of dengue is uh, as you can see in this graph clearly shows that 2019 was by far the worst year where we recorded over 5 million cases but uh, even during the covid season uh, we did have dengue and there were dengue reported all through the year 2022 we had quite a number of cases and we expect uh, 23 also to be a bad year as the indications are and uh, this trend is uh, really a matter of concern in terms of mortality it is more or less the same trend and uh, but the good news about dengue deaths is that with sound case management uh the case fatality rate in majority of the countries are below 1 which is very very good but it also helps us to monitor that the management of since we don't have any drugs nor an effective vaccine we know that the medical faculty especially are doing a great job to manage severe cases in hospital and reduce fatality the the biggest interesting uh, uh, trend here is that even nature had reported this that dengue is the only communicable disease which has increased by almost eight fold since the year 2000 and this graph clearly illustrates that that uh, the dengue cases have exponentially increased and it as i said in the beginning it's a silent arboviral disease which has expanded and uh, we need to do a much more work concerted work to deal with this disease the biggest challenge we face is that 80% of the cases are asymptomatic and this calls for burden estimation 
So countries are encouraged to do burden estimation. And this is an example to show that even countries are reporting, for example, in 2018, the country reported about 10,000 plus cases, 24 deaths, but actually the, when you really do a thorough study of the burden in the, in the whole country, there were about 7,900 severe cases. Dengue fever itself was over half a million and there are more asymptomatic cases. So this part of the pyramid, we don't really record in health systems. And unless or until we capture that part of the pyramid, we cannot use it for greater advocacy because we need to convey this message that dengue is a silent disease with 80% being asymptomatic and we won't know much about it uh, to our political leaders so that they are, they are fully aware that when a second serotype comes over, it, we could have more severe cases. And this is, a, this is an alarm bell which we really need to highlight because dengue uh, needs a much greater advocacy in terms of the burden. It is, it's a really high burden disease and we need our political leaders to accept this and move this, pro this disease into a programmatic mode because we need to treat it as an, as an endemic disease with epidemic potential and we have to move as a, as a, a control program. We have also, starting this year, we will encourage countries to do uh, more insecticide resistance monitoring because we have done for the first time a multi-center study which concluded the discriminating dosage from 23 laboratories all over the world. And the first, for the first time, we have separate discriminating dosages for ADIS and you can download it from this document. We also we need to, as, as I look forward in the way forward, we really need to see that dengue is in a very interesting situation. It is not uh, a bleak uh, environment. We have a lot of developments as we move forward. First of all, in diagnostics, we have several multiplexes under development and industry is keen to promote this, which will probably diagnose a whole range of arboviruses. And this is encouraging and we hope good quality diagnostics will, will be made available soon. There are better tools for surveillance today. So we are definitely, we can tap on the new surveillance systems which are in place for COVID and other integrated disease packages and improve surveillance, both for entomology, uh, epidemiological surveillance, as well as the lab surveillance. Case management is improving significantly. As I said in the beginning, the case fatality rate is below one and we, we hope and our goal is to reduce deaths to zero by 2030. This is the global target. In terms of vector control, there are several sustainable tools in the pipeline. We hope to come up with recommendations on Bulbakia soon, um, at least for the replacement method. Then we, the uh, suppression Bulbakia is also undergoing studies along with sterile insect technique, spatial repellent, and also targeted indoor spraying, which is a something which got delayed due to COVID, but I understand the studies are ongoing right now. There are also vaccines in the pipeline. We have one vaccine which is registered, but with limited use, but there is two other vaccines in the pipeline, which we hope will come up with their recommendations in due course. As I said in the beginning, we really need to, uh, we need to include all these innovations in the health system and integrate into existing programs wherever feasible. Just to conclude, I really want to highlight that dengue is a problem linked closely with climate change, and we need to find ways to mitigate it at every country level. Uh, the climate refugees and, uh, is also linked with movement of vectors. They, as I said, their vectors are continually moved, and uh, these vectors were present in half a dozen countries uh, before 1970, but today they are present in over 130 countries. The increased urbanization and possible large scale outbreak is, is, is real because uh, our biggest problem is dengue affects urban pockets. And when it affects urban pockets, the population at risk is huge and we really need to be on guard. We need to use the lessons from COVID. For example, can we tap on the diagnostic platforms, especially the PCR, enhance surveillance, including burden estimation. There is much better methods of communication, factual, communication to be made. And we have learned a lot during this COVID period. We, we can utilize that. How to involve communities. We need to address this in a much more comprehensive way. 
And lastly, we also need to address gender equity and the human rights issues right through in our documents. And we hope that uh, the, the dengue situation will improve in the coming years as we get all these tools together. So with that, thank you very much. And uh, I will stop sharing my screen and it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Judith Wong, who would now talk to us on um, the diagnostics part of the dengue and the challenges we have and which are the best uh, diagnostic tools right now we have. So over to you, Judith. Thanks, Dr. Raman. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. We'll wait for the slides to come out. Thank you. Firstly, thank you to WHO for the invitation to share our experience and everyone for your time. Um, I will be providing an introduction of dengue diagnostics and the opportunities and challenges that we face presently. Next. So on dengue diagnostics, one important difference that most of us would know is that compared with diagnosis of other viral infections, because we may be infected by multiple dengue serotypes over time, there would be a difference in how we look at the blood profiles between a premi and subsequent dengue infection. And so this is really important for us when we are thinking about dengue diagnostics. So in a premi case, after the peak in viral antigen, we would expect IgM to rise before IgG, while in a secondary or subsequent case, IgG would peak about the same time with the viral antigen and RNA peak. So expectedly, we do need to appreciate this difference when we think about using the tools for diagnosis and also how we interpret the diagnostic test result. Next. Next slide. So this chart provides a summary of the assays that we frequently use now in dengue diagnostics as well as surveillance. And I will take us through the types of assays that we have. So firstly, we talk about the rapid diagnostic test kits, which is the first one. And this is the one that is most frequently used for diagnosis currently, as they offer a very quick turnaround time. They are very simple to use. They are like a cartridge, almost similar to the ART test that we are familiar with for COVID-19, just that instead of doing a swab, we are putting in serum or a blood drop. Um, however, with this rapid test kit in our experience, we have observed that many of the kits have varied performances, and this is across kit brands as well as batches. Um, additionally, they may cross-react with other flaviviruses or anti-nuclear antibodies. Um, for some of the kits that we have tested, we have also found a level of false positivity for IgM, as well as misleading IgG results. So while we are implementing this and taking this on as part of our suite of diagnostic tests, we do need to be mindful about the test kits that we use. And evaluation is really key um, in, in this regard. And um, I just put an, um, maybe state an example, for example, for the IgG band, um, some kits will state quite clearly that any detection is indicative or calibrated to a secondary dengue IgG level. However, some others are silent on this. So we do need to be very careful when we think about diagnosis, not to um, diagnose acute secondary dengue incorrectly. So we do need to do a level of e evaluation for this test kit. Um, so now I'll move on to the next suite of test types, which is ELISA's. And um, this is a common serological assay that we use uh, for detection of dengue NS1, IgM, and IgG. And although this method takes longer than the rapid test kits, they do offer ad advantages to some level, especially when more samples need to be screened. And this could be used maybe in a regional lab or in a reference lab. Um, generally speaking, the test performance for this test, um, test platform is generally more stable, although cross-reactivity with other flaviviruses and anti-nuclear antibodies do exist. Now, the next common tool that we use, and it's one area that it's really rapidly ex expanding, as what Dr. Raman has shared, is that of uh, PCR and molecular techniques. So they test for um, viral RNA, and because of COVID, Many labs now have this platform, and this is really a good opportunity for us to pivot existing COVID-19 platforms for dengue diagnosis and surveillance. 
um, in terms of the test kits available, they do come in various forms, such as, for example, a plan, pan flabby virus screening tool. It, there are also trioplex assays which offer detection for dengue, Zika, and chikungunya at the same time. And there are also more specific assays that test for dengue serotyping. Um, in our experience so far, when we have evaluated a number of these test kits, there may be some trade-offs between test sensitivity and the number of targets. So for example, for some multiplex assays, they may be less sensitive than maybe if we look for just one um, viral antigen or viral target specifically. So hence, the selection of the assay that we want to use for diagnosis is very important. We do need to understand the backdrop of arbovirus circulation in our respective regions of interest and our diagnostic or surveillance objective. So for example, if an area is, um, we, we know it's endemic for dengue, but doesn't really have many um, chikungunya or Zika cases, there might be value in looking at a more specific assay, whereas in other areas where there are multi arbovirus circulation, then perhaps a pen screening tool would be useful. Now, the last approach is that of sequencing. And again, COVID-19 opened up opportunities for us to tap into this capability for dengue surveillance as well. And although the turnaround time does take longer and it's not used routinely for diagnosis, it could be very helpful for surveillance as it provides high resolution data for us to understand what is happening. Next slide. The next slide, please. So right now, I will share some challenges which we have encountered so far in the area of diagnosis. And um, these are really some practical handles which we've picked up along the way. And I think it would be important for us to be mindful about, especially now that we do see dengue as an expanding epidemic. So we have evaluated a couple of um, dengue test kits in um, our experience. And for example, in the first paper here, we found that there were cross-reactivity with Zika, which is a flavivirus, as well as chikungunya, which is an alpha virus. So these results, um, though not surprising, it's really an indication that we need to be mindful when we are thinking of adopting a test kit and that evaluation is critical. Um, in the bottom panel, um, we did the reverse. Conversely, when we evaluated Zika test kits, again, we found cross-reactivity, but this time when we used dengue positive samples. So it is a common problem, but uh, there are opportunities, there are solutions, and there are also test kits with have, which have better performance. So we do need to be mindful about what would be useful for our context. Next. And over here, this is also another example to say that, you know, in, apart from serological assays, molecular assays are also not spared in the sense that um, there are also limited limitations in performance. So in this report here, we, we found that um, our primer probes, which used to work for most dengue sequences, didn't work for a cohort of samples. And when we did a deep dive, we then realized that it was because of virus mutations which resulted in a less sensitive primer and probe um, binding assay. So this again emphasizes the need for us to really understand what is circulating and to avoid detection dropouts. Next. So with that, I will summarize how we can integrate diagnostics and surveillance tools together into a workflow for early warning and to guide vector control. Uh, we have established a surveillance system together with the Ministry of Health in Singapore, where samples which test positive from different diagnostic labs are sent to our lab or the Ministry of Health for serotyping. And serotyping of positive samples, the, the results are then sent to the Ministry of Health, as well as the vector control operations team in our ministry, which is the Environment Agency, to guide vector control operations. Additionally, Test negative samples in our diagnostic laboratories are also screened for flaviviruses and chikungunya. So this provides an enhanced surveillance for other um, arboviral diseases which may not be circulating, but occasionally we do experience sporadic cases. And this surveillance platform really helps us to pick up some of these cases um, in an early way. Next. So this slide shows how we use the serotype data. So we may ask ourselves, what is the use of doing serotype 
serotyping PCR. Um, traditionally and historically, we have seen that every time we have a serotype switch, they may precede a dengue outbreak. Hence, the monitoring of serotype switches do help us to understand the situation, and it serves as an early warning for us when there, it could suggest that could, there could be a surge in cases. So when we do see the trend of a serotype switch coming along, then in Singapore, we would actually alert, for example, the community, as well as premises owners, to make a conscious effort in reducing breathing spots and to take precautions against dengue. And collectively, this would help us to avert certain outbreaks. Um, and so with that, I end the presentation on dengue diagnosis, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Judith. Thank you very much uh, for an excellent presentation. Uh, let us move on. Our next speaker is Dr. Lucy Lum, uh, Professor of Pediatrics, University of MLA, Malaysia. Over to you, Professor Lucy. Thank you, Dr. Rahman. Can you hear me? Yes. A good day to everyone around the globe. It's uh, good to see all of you. And uh, thank you, Dr. Rahman, for inviting me to share my experience on case management of dengue. Now, when we looked at case management of dengue, we really need to put all the signs and symptoms within the context of the clinical cause of the disease. That's the only way for us to be able to make meaningful interpretation of the signs and symptoms. So the disease, I'm not going to talk about the incubation period, but it's a very important period. Because can, you please, uh, can you please upload your slide? Uh, share your slide? Share. Okay, sorry. Um, can you see it now? Yeah, please put it on presentation mode. Yeah. So whenever we uh, talk about dengue um, management, we need to put out the context of the signs and symptoms within this uh, clinical uh, cause of the disease. So during the incubation period, and which I'm not going to talk about, but changes are already occurring in the body that uh, determines the changes that we see in the peripheral blood film in the following days. Now, after the incubation period, there's a high viremia, and this together with this is the start of the fever. So during this phase, the fever is very high and they are the viremic symptoms. And this phase lasts, the minimum is 72 hours, All right? And this phase of the fever with the viremia symptoms is not distinguishable from other viral diseases such as the COVID, influenza or the adenovirus. So the only way to recognize the disease around this at this time is to do a diagnostic laboratory test. Right now, once the, the past the 72 hours, so if the patient is going to go into the critical phase, he will transit at about the time of the fever coming down. So during this phase, there are two phenomena that make the disease critical. One is the increased capillary permeability leading to plasma leakage and bleeding. Now this phase is uh, self-limiting. It lasts no more than 48 hours. And uh, past the 48 hours, the patient then transits into the recovery phase. Now the recovery does not refer to the recovery of the thrombocytopenia, but recovery of the plasma leakage. And therefore there is reabsorption of the fluid that has leaked out. All right, so now, now that we know the cause, we know that this is a very dynamic disease and there are clinical problems that are unique to each phase. So the first 72 hours, maximum, uh, minimum is 72 hours. Any time after the 72 hours, the patient goes into the immune phase of the disease where they could, where the severity of the disease declares itself. Now, during the viremic phase, the main problems are related to the high fever and the viremic symptoms of nausea. And very quickly, the patient develops dehydration and become at risk of electrolyte imbalance and energy and fluid deficits. Now, if they have comorbid conditions such as diabetes, all these will play into this dehydration and exacerbate it. Now, during the, the uh, immunological phase, this is the critical phase of disease, as we've mentioned, these are the things that, uh, these are the problems that determine the severity of the disease. 
uh, uh, the plasma leakage, bleeding, and organ impairment. And then after that, the patient transits. After 48 hours, the patient transits into the fluid, uh, uh, into reabsorption, and there could be a risk of fluid overload if the doctors are not aware of the, uh, that the patient has actually uh, moved on. Now, in the past, and even now, we are making the diagnosis, recognizing the disease during the critical phase. And it's not uh, difficult to understand why, because during the first 72 hours, the disease is indistinguishable. And even if patients present early, the full blood count is going to be normal. But at this phase, during the critical phase, the platelets have dropped and the hematocrit has, dried, has gone up. Now, it may take a while for the lab diagnosis to be made. And during this time, the, the doctors may not be aware that they are dealing with a severe dengue in the critical phase. And if on top of that, the problems that had occurred during the viremic phase have not been resolved, now they will just accumulate and become more during the year. So increasing fluid deficit, energy deficit, and uh, if they have comorbid conditions and added on top of that, you know, the drugs that have been used like paracetamol and NSAIDs, this is really going to create conditions for, for a perfect storm. And added on top of that, the first few hours of the critical phase, the doctors may not be aware that they are dealing with a severe dengue because the platelet counts may take a while to come back, one or two hours. So during this time, they may be not only in a perfect storm, but they are flying in the dark. So really, we, the patients are not going to get very good outcome if we are recognizing the disease at this phase. So we really need to leverage on what we have nowadays, which is the ability to make an early diagnosis and be more proactive and take an integrative approach to disease in case management. So I'm going to talk about the phase of the disease, the problems and how we, would, we should manage. So during the febrile phase, the first three days of fever, high fever, risk of dehydration, we need to quickly make a diagnosis, confirm the diagnosis of dengue with a rapid diagnostic test, establish the baseline hematocrit so that we know where we are in terms of patient's baseline, and do a risk assessment for any comorbid conditions. And if they are present, to consider early admission for stabilization okay, at this phase, even in the early phase, not for an IV drip, but to stabilize their underlying diabetes, renal failure, and other diseases. And this phase should be managed with by intense oral rehydration with electrolyte solutions. And if any antiparactics are used, we should be really careful with this. And if patients are not admitted, they need to be educated on the warning signs and what happens when the fever comes down. Otherwise, they, they may not be able to connect the dots that the fever of um, three days ago and the symptoms now are actually related. Right, And uh, if possible, identify the hospital for the emergency treatment and daily follow-up for the hydration status and progression to severe disease. Now, during the critical phase, I've outlined the problems. So we need to identify this quickly with a hemodynamic assessment and a prompt resuscitation with crystalloid and colloid titrated to a therapeutic endpoint. And if bleeding is uh, recognized, we should prioritize urgent transfusion of fresh PEC cells and uh, uh, red blood cells. Now, the glucose and the electrolytes got to be maintained throughout the illness. And if they have comorbid conditions, this has to be addressed aggressively. Very, very important. All right. Now, as for iatrogenic problems like fluid overload, excessive fluid accumulation, these the key here is to prevent it from happening. And this we can do that by observing the four phases of fluid resuscitation and to de-escalate fluid therapy below the maintenance fluid before stopping the IV drip. Now, during the reabsorption phase, down, uh, the, we need to de-escalate the fluid and use minimal IV fluid to maintain the electrolytes and correct the, electro, uh, the electrolytes with just minimal fluid. So to summarize the fluid therapy and phases of dengue, in terms of fluid therapy, during the viral phase, the oral therapy, fluid therapy should be a prescribed fluid therapy, meaning that we need to identify the amount of fluid patients need to drink, how to achieve that amount, what type of fluids they should drink, and then if possible, document it so that we know exactly where we are. 
Now, during the critical phase, if they develop shock, obviously intravenous fluids would be indicated, if not oral fluids, and with frequent uh, review of the situation. Now, this is very self-limiting at this point. It doesn't need to go on forever. And then the patient transits into the recovery period. We need to switch off the IV drip and get back to oral fluid again with careful monitoring of the electrolytes. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lucy. Um, we, would, uh, we are running a bit behind schedule. So Samira, may I request Dr. Samira to talk on vector control now, please? and uh, kindly keep to seven minutes. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to be now starting. Can you see my presentation? Not yet. Can you see it now? No. Mm. Okay, let me share again. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming, yeah. Put it on the presentation mode, yeah. Yeah, now it's yeah. clear? Yes, yes, please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you. So, so both Aedes aegypti and Aedes alpepectus are highly invasive and continue to spread as seen here in this map of the Eastern Mediterranean region. Particularly Aedes aegypti is spreading within the countries to new areas with reported dengue cases. Aedes aegypti is present in 11 countries and they report dengue cases. In the graph here, we, we see here in the graph, the number of reported dengue outbreaks are increasing as seen in 2019 and continue to increase, and we are still approaching the transmission season. So available vector control approaches that have been used to control dengue and other vector-borne diseases can be affected, effective if implemented well and sustained. Vector control aims to reduce the populations of vectors and or reduce human contact with vectors. For some vector-borne diseases like dengue, effective treatment or vaccines are lacking. Hence, prevention through vector control is the only control option. You see here we have chemical and we have non-chemical. So chemical, these are insecticides used to target the adult stage and also the immature stages like the insecticide treated nets. And we have also the sp spraying of insecticides and lava siding. There is a list of WHO pre-qualified vector control products to select from. These are recommended as they have been assessed to meet the global standards of quality, safety, efficacy. The efficacy also depends on the susceptibility to the targeted disease vectors. To target the adult uh, stage using insecticides such as in the pregnated bed nets and also the chemical lava sites. Topical repellents may also be beneficial as an intervention to provide protection against dengue. The non-chemical is uh, focusing on uh, envir environmental management, source reduction, and I'll show you in the next slide the examples for source reduction. And also we can use in some, in some cases, uh, lava virus fish as a potential biological control to reduce the immature stages of the dengue vector. However, due to the study design and quality issues, further investigation is needed to generate evidence for impact of lava virus fish. So there are, therefore there is no single intervention that is most effective and programs apply integrated combinations of interventions that are most appropriate to the situation and require the local national government support and intersectoral collaboration. That is to say bringing together the health sector and other relevant sectors. So I bring here, these are examples of breeding sites from the Eastern Mediterranean region. So the gravid female Aedes aegypti deposits its eggs inside a variety of man-made habitats, household containers, water storage containers, and objects inside and around houses in the urban setting. Aedes alpepectus uses both urban and rural habitats. Tires are very attractive. The preferred dark color, and the shade attracts the Aedes aegypti to deposit its eggs and use as breeding habitat, like this picture here, where this tire was used to shade a plant, and we found many Aedes aegypti. 
Eggs are laid one by one in breeding sites and a full batch is spread over several breeding sites. These are waterproofed eggshells capable of resting, uh, resisting desiccation, drying out, and unhatched eggs are viable for months, up to eight months. And in the absence of water, upon contact of water, they hatch and they emerge in, they, they release the larvae, which grows into pupa, then adults. So uh, the most productive have been a, uh, air conditioners, these old air conditioners, also the clay pots known as zeers, locally made, the water coolers, and also discarded objects, and of course the tires. So, so uh, source reduction, that's say destroying, removing, or treating all potential breeding habitats, and therefore reducing adult mosquitoes in all areas affected by or at risk of dengue, engaging and mobilizing communities. This is really important for the sustainability of vector control. These photos showing raising awareness on dengue and transmission and source reduction and encouraging householders to conduct as a family activity, a community activity. These photographs show how community involvement to prevent mosquito breeding in locally made zeers by community made covered, uh, community made covers or scrubbing the containers to remove the eggs. Uh, photos also show female community volunteers removing unused tires and using them for building walls as we see here in this photo. In addition, application of chemical and biological larva size to water storage containers and other larval habitats can be effective in reducing immature vector populations. WHO pre-qualified larva sites are also recommended. Deploying of surveillance tools like gravity traps can be used for surveillance, including to monitor the impact of vector control activities. And as a control, these traps reduce the adult AD's density, including infective uh, Aedes mosquitoes. So this is quickly just to show you the space spraying aimed to suppress ongoing epidemic or prevent an incident outbreak of Aedes born disease by a massive rapid destruction of infective adult mosquito population. Outdoor fogging has no or very limited impact on disease transmission. So indoor fogging is more effective if applied every two to three days for two weeks than every week for another week. Uh, WHO pre-qualified recommended insecticides. You see here, there's a website which gives you the uh, best effective insecticides. However, there needs to be uh, insecticide resistant monitoring to identify and to procure the most suitable, which is the susceptible insecticide to the local Aedes population. Uh, another challenge we have is uh, currently the invasive Anopheles stephensi, and this has been spreading outside the established region. It's an important urban malaria vector, a major malaria vector in Afghanistan, India, Iran, Pakistan, and a primary vector in Djibouti uh, following its establishment. So the, this Anopheles stephensi is very uh, close uh, breeding with Aedes aegypti. They have common breeding sites. The main challenge is that Anopheles stephensi also proliferates in the urban sites in this, uh, as I said, in the similar human uh, made habitats and have been found to coexist with Aedes aegypti. This increases the burden on vector control programs. However, there's an opportunity for integrated vector surveillance and control, especially through source reduction. So the challenges, these are the challenges for vector control. The limited expertise in vector control program management and surveillance has issues for implementation for the integrated vector control management. There's a many challenges, uh, as we see here, the human resource sort, uh, shortage and capacity, inadequate coordination and collaboration, the high turnover of qualified staff, the extreme climatic events leading to spreading of invasive vectors, limited options for low cost of insecticides since we have a more increasing insecticide resistance, poor community engagement, which is really important for sustainable vector control in controlling uh, aedes born diseases, uh, and also the Anopheles stephensi. In the challenges for Anopheles stephensi, there's gaps in knowledge on distribution, behavior, bionomics, and effective control of invasive vectors. The role of these inv invasive Anopheles stephensi and Aedes aegypti in the local transmission. Uh, as I said, insecticide resistance and limited resources, human and financial. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samira. Thank you very much for a comprehensive presentation.
Let's now move on to Dr. Giovannini to talk on community engagement. Uh, over to you, Giovannini. Uh, please note, Giovannini will speak in Spanish. So kindly use the interpretation available. Samira, can you presentation? Samira, can you please stop the slide, sharing of slide? Could you see my presentation, Ramon? Yeah, it has come. Yes. yes. Please put it in the yeah presentation mode. Bueno, buena, bueno, muchas gracias. Buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches a todos que nos atenden. Lo tema que me toca hoy es hablar sobre el la participación comunitaria y las acciones necesarias para su involucramiento. Yo empezaría inicialmente con una... Perdón, mi... Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Giovannini. Can you please okay, okay. in presentation mode? Excellent. Ok. Bueno, yo empezaría inicialmente con este slide uh, destacando lo tema central que es la, la participación comunitaria en la región de las Américas bajo uh, dos modelos de trabajo aprobados por los países y que la, la Organización Panamericana de Salud lidera uh, con apoyo de los países. La primera es la estrategia de gestión integrada para la prevención de las doenças arboviales la segunda, el plan de acción de entomología y control de vectores. Estas dos estrategias uh, tienen uh, el tema de la, de la comunicación y la participación comunitaria como temas transversales que deben y que trabajan junto con los distintos y diferentes componentes uh, de la estrategia de gestión integrada, a ejemplo de la epidemiología, del cuidado del paciente, el medio ambiente, laboratorio, etc. O sea, participación comunitaria y movilización de la comunidad es un tema central que orienta uh, las intervenciones de lucha contra las arbovirosas. Bueno, la Organización Panamericana de Salud tiene, tiene desarrollado una serie de actividades en apoyo a los países, un, yo quería destacar una de ellas, que es exactamente la Semana de Lucha contra los Mojitos, que es una semana de movilización en el continente, donde diferentes mensajes para la comunidad son desarrolladas. Y aquí yo tengo un mensaje específico para la protección de las viviendas, que claro, cada país ha, hace sus, sus adaptaciones uh, y un otro mensaje específico para los viajeros como una medida preventiva. Y por último, también un mensaje clave a respecto de los signos de alarma, que especialmente para el dengue, que uh, la población debe tener en cuenta y buscar los servicios de salud identificar ese signo de alarma y buscar los servicios de salud. Bueno, en las próximas diapositivas yo voy a presentar al menos dos experiencias de países que yo considero muy interesantes e importantes y que reflejan de alguna manera la, la aprobación de la estrategia de gestión integrada, del modelo de trabajo de la, de la estrategia de gestión integrada por los países. Un primer ejemplo es de Brasil, que es un país continental, responsable por casi 80% de los casos uh, de dengue en la región de las Américas, que tiene un sistema de salud extremadamente complejo, pero que es capaz, bajo la rectoría del Ministerio de Salud, de desarrollar mensajes claves y campañas de movilización que llega a los distintos niveles eh, de los sistemas de salud, sistema estadual eh, y municipal. Y también trabaja con múltiples intervenciones y múltiples mensajes para diferentes eh, públicos blancos. 
La próxima, o outro exemplo, viene de México. E aqui, uma experiência local, de la ciudad de Mérida, donde el concepto de manejo integral de vectores utilizado en esta intervención fue, fue adoptado y donde, de una manera bien articulada entre los actores comunitarios, las autoridades locales, se logró uh, desarrollar una estrategia de reciclaje uh, para el bienestar de la y un punto importante que es fundamental en este proceso es que esa iniciativa también tuvo un proceso de evaluación de impacto utilizando métodos entomológicos, como mi colega presentó anticipadamente, que demostró el impacto y la reducción de los principales índices aéticos. Esto es un aspecto importante porque... Uh, uh, la demostración del impacto de esas intervenciones son fundamentales, por ejemplo, para garantizar de alguna manera la participación de la comunidad. Y finalmente, yo trajo algunas, una última reflexión sobre lo que necesitamos hacer para seguir uh, nos moviendo uh, para garantizar la participación de la comunidad. Uh, este es un engrenaje complejo, Trabajar con la comunidad no es una actividad sencilla. Y en esta diapositiva yo quiero destacar dos aspectos fundamentales. Lo primero, la necesidad de tener programas nacionales fortalecidos para que el papel rector de, de los programas sea uh, establecido de manera que la producción de las informaciones sea hecha de manera clara y bajo las evidencias disponibles. El segundo aspecto de respecto al fortalecimiento de los programas locales de prevención y control uh, de las arboviroses. Es fundamental, las personas viven eh, en nivel local. Tener programas locales organizados y estructurados es clave para garantizar una calidad de las intervenciones. Y por último, la participación de las comunidades, de las familias y de los individuos es clave para garantir la sostenibilidad de todas, de todas estas intervenciones. Con esto yo finalizo mi presentación y de antemano agradezco mucho una vez más la oportunidad. Gracias. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Very interesting presentation. So basically, I wish to thank all the speakers for having such a a comprehensive coverage of all the topics on dengue. Uh, we have had several questions, but we will try to answer them through email. Uh, just to take a few of them, one on the vaccines, we may have another session on dengue later, if uh, uh, time permits later on, we will uh, include vaccines, but essentially the dengue vaccine, we know one vaccine is registered in over 20 countries. Uh, that is the Sanofi Pasture one, but uh, it has limitations where it works only if you are sure that you had dengue once, and it is recommended for an age group of nine to 45. The second vaccine of Takeda is currently still under WHO uh, review, and uh, there is uh, more work. Uh, the, the recommendation probably will come only by the end of this year, and we are hoping that Takeda vaccine also would, would come up for us, though it is being registered by few agencies. Few other general questions. Dengue mosquitoes do bite during the daytime, so we need to take care of yourself during the day. And uh, in terms of immunity against the four serotypes, if you are infected with one serotype, you have a lifelong protection against it, but that does not guarantee uh, cross immunity for the other three. So after a couple of years, there is every chance that you could de get dengue for a second time. And usually, the secondary infections are more severe. So we need to be on guard. So I, I think I'll stop there. There are some interesting questions, many of which uh, answers can be found in the dengue fact sheet uh, in the WHO website and others, you are free to contact us on email and we will reply to you. Over to you, Agnesa. Thank you, Raman. Thank you, everybody. As we're coming to the end of our allotted time, I will wrap up by saying thank you 
very much to all our speakers today, our interpreters, the WHO colleagues who have worked on this webinar and the EPWIN team, Bria, Zanfang, Gabriella, Supriya team, overseen by Dr. Sylvie Briand. Finally, thank you to all of you for coming and for your questions. The recording of this webinar will be available at the EPWIN website. And uh, if you want to keep updated on future EPWIN webinars, please subscribe to our mailing list, but links will be appearing in the chat. Uh, we hope you will join us uh, for our next webinar next to Wednesday, 16th of August on Lassa Fever. Details will be posted shortly on the website and sent to the mailing list. Thank you, everybody. Thank you again.